So we're going to stay with uh, Towson. I, uh, we have Dr. Devin uh, Dobachowski. He is a Towson Tiger. He was formerly, I noted, uh, LSU Tiger. He did his, uh, did his doctorate uh, uh, work there. He was also um, a faculty member um, at, at this institution of, of Johns Hopkins, and he's uh, one of the faculty from Johns Hopkins, or excuse me, uh, currently from, uh, from Towson. And uh, he's going to talk to us very interesting and pertinent topic of uh, sleep apnea and as it, how it uh, role with exercise. All right. Thank you, Dr. Schaefer, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for sticking here to the bitter end here. Uh, does anybody find it ironic that the sleep talk is at the end of the day? <clears throat> so I hope everybody sticks with me here. Uh, a, one, a benefit I have in speaking at the end is I get to hear everybody else talk, and I get to reinforce some of the things that other people spoke about. And if we want to embrace this exercise as medicine metaphor, I, uh, I would like to start out by looking at what a natural drug prescription might look like on the bottle of medication. Uh, this would appear on the bottle of metropolol, and metropolol, uh, as most of you know, is a common cardiovascular medication. And there's several pieces import, important pieces in, of information on the label. The first is the name itself. And while the name may not mean much to patients, it certainly means a lot to physicians. And metropolol is a beta blocker. It blocks the effects of epinephrine and reduces blood pressure and heart rate and contractility. And so what is implied there is a mechanism of action for why the drug works. Second is the instructions for use for the medication. And this is very clear. Take one tablet by mouth twice per day, 25 milligrams. And the reason I enforce this is when we get to the exercise piece, uh, it's very important to give people, I think, very good instructions on how much to exercise, when to exercise. Um, and, but the fi final, the, the other uh, piece of information that is also very important is on the right side here, which describes warnings or side effects of a medication and things that may imply interference. So what, is, what potentially could interfere with the medication to prevent it from working? Now, this label doesn't appear on metropolol, but it would appear on a statin where it says, do not eat a grapefruit or drink grapefruit juice at the end uh, at a time while taking this medication. And that is because, that is because grapefruit contains a substance that is going to interfere with the drug's mechanism of action. So using that as the context, I want to move through here. And again, it's, it's, it's nice to see that Samir covered some of this already. And he demonstrated that one thing that we're really confident about with regard to the effectiveness of the exercise is its impact on cardiovascular disease, morbidity, and mortality. And exercise is cardioprotective. And this study just came out this week in circulation and is a st prospective study of over 500,000 people. And they showed consistent and robust inverse associations between objectively measured fitness and cardiovascular outcomes. And on the right-hand side, you have the hazard ratio for people uh, separate into low moderate and high cardiorespiratory fitness categories, and there is a stepwise reduction in risk with higher levels of cardiorespiratory fitness. And also, they also organize people into genetic risk categories. So there's a genetic component to everything, and some people are predisposed to have cardiovascular disease, but importantly, those people who had a high uh, genetic risk, if they were uh, very high fit, then their risk of having an incident, cardiovascular disease incident, was significantly less. And the same can be said for physical activity. And this is a study of over 27,000 women. The, uh, the Women's Health Initiative study followed for over 10 years, and they looked at their levels of self-reported physical activity at baseline and followed them to see who would get um, cardiovascular disease and coronary heart disease. 
and they found that there's an inverse relationship between levels of physical activity and incident of cardiovascular disease. And then they took it a step further and look, they looked at all these other factors that we assume are changed as a result of physical activity, levels of inflammation, blood pressure. So we would think that these things get better as well. But if we looked at the uh, risk explanation uh, for why people have this protection, the level of, if you add up all of these factors, only about, it only accounts for about 60% of the risk reduction in people uh, for cardiovascular events, leaving us with about a 40% risk factor gap. In other words, we know exercise works, but we have no idea why. And so a lot of the attention over the last couple decades now has focused here. And this was mentioned before, I think in a couple of talks, uh, the vascular endothelium. And the endothelium is the monolayer of cells lining the inner wall of every vascular uh, or blood vessel in the body. And its damage or destruction is believed to be the initiating event in atherosclerosis because it plays such an important role in the regulation of hemostasis, fibrinolysis, inflammation, angiogenesis, and regulating vascular tone. So keeping it healthy is important for avoiding, avoiding cardiovascular risk. So <clears throat> we believe now that exercise targets the endothelium, has a very strong effect on the vascular endothelium. So if you see on the left-hand side here, this is a, a brachial artery, a large conduit vessel in the blood. And this is the brachial artery during muscle contractions, continuous muscle contractions of a person squeezing a hand grip device. And there's obviously a lot of movement there. But if you look on the left side, the Doppler flow signal, you'll see that blood flow is going up and down. It's moving across the endothelium of that vessel. And on the right side, we have an increase in sheer stress on the vascular wall, which triggers a cascade of events, ultimately leading to the production and release of nitric oxide, which is a potent vasodilator and vaso, um, cardioprotective molecule. So, uh, with repetitive bouts of exercise that occur over time, what we believe happens here is that this increased shear stress leads to increased nitric oxide release, which leads to vasodilation. And with early training, within weeks of training, what happens is this repetitive shear stress, if your prescription is correct, leads to an upregulation of the nitric oxide dilator system, making this system work more effectively. And then over a period of time, over weeks and months, we have nitric oxide mediated remodeling. And the nitric oxide release goes back to normal, but we have very large vessels that are able to buffer and accommodate any increases in shear stress and keep the vascular system healthy. Now, a number of studies have been published over the last decade and a half looking at these, the effects of exercise on various uh, um, vas the areas of the vascular system, including the coronary arteries. Those improve vasodilatory func function. Skin microcirculation improves. Peripheral resistance arteries improve their function. And also, as I showed you there, large conduit vessels like the radial artery, the brachial artery, and even the femoral artery respond to vascular or to exercise training. And when I was a graduate student at LSU, we actually did a regional exercise stimulus where we had people grip a hand grip over a course of four weeks so we could just induce a localized effect. And indeed, we show that there were vascular improvements in as little as two weeks. 
So if we go back to the, the drugs prescription, let's flip it around now. Let's look at an exercise prescription. What exactly we, do we know with regard to cardiovascular health and exercise? Well, if we want to put a name here, it's that aerobic exercise seems to have the largest impact on cardiovascular health. And we think it's because it induces a sheer stress across, across the vascular endothelium. Well, what is the prescription? Well, we could spend quite a bit of time on that, but it seems that exercise of three to four days per week, which is within those guidelines of moderate intensity, appears to have the most dramatic effect on changes in vascular endothelial health. But is there anything else we have to worry about with regard to interference? Is there anything that interferes with this mechanism and precludes us from improving our vascular health with exercise. So that's the question mark and that'll be the second half of my talk here. Uh, uh, Rita earlier this morning talked about the SHAPE2 study. I'm glad she cited the study. I'm glad somebody's reading some of the work that I have done. Uh, and. She, uh, the sugar hypertension and physical exercise trial uh, was for uh, individuals 40 to 65 with type 2 diabetes and hypertension, and we tr exercise trained them for six months. So they went through uh, s about 70 people were enrolled in a 45 minutes of aerobic exercise combined with resistance training, and then an another 70 individuals were enrolled in a controlled condition. And she said that there were no changes in blood pressure. That was the main outcome. Guess what happened to endothelial function, however? No change. Absolutely nothing. We didn't see any change over the course of six months. And so which leads any scientist or clinician to ponder, well, what happened or maybe what did not happen? So some of the things that we, that we talked about is did vascular remodeling change? Well, that seemed unlikely because the size of the vessel didn't change in the brachial artery. Was the intensity, the volume adequate? And this is always a question that we might have. That seems unlikely because fitness improved and all these, some of these other cardiovascular risk factors improved. Was it the combined approach, the fact that we did aerobic exercise as well as resistance training? That seems unlikely because we've seen changes in the past that have combined these types of exercise. But it was a conversation with the pulmonary and critical care physicians Dr. Sushil here, Patel, Patel here, there he is back there. It was a conversation with this group that introduced us to something that we did not think about at all, certainly I did not appreciate, is the impact potentially of sleep apnea in modifying this change. And they said, they have sleep apnea. That's not why they're changing. So. What is it? Because I was certainly clueless as to what this condition was. And obstructive sleep apnea is characterized by repeated episodes of upper airway obstruction, reductions in ventilation, arousal, and deoxyhemoglobin desaturations over the course of the, of the night. And on the left-hand side, you have someone who is a normal breathing, getting seven to nine hours of sleep per night, whereas this person on the right is an obstructive sleep apnea, and they are uh, having airway obstruction leading to all these cardiovascular consequences that set up people for vascular disease. And some of these things look familiar because they're oxidative stress, inflammation, setting them up for cardiovascular disease. So could it be that having sleep apnea attenuates our ability to improve vascular health with exercise? And exercise is recommended as a behavioral treatment strategy for people with sleep apnea, but it's studied more of a treatment for OSA rather than whether sleep apnea actually modifies cardiovascular health. And uh, we did a study where we looked at exercise and diet 
and looked at changes in weight over the course of three months in obese adults who were older, and they exercised three times a week, and yes, they lost weight, and yes, their AHI changed, their sleep apnea severities changed, but the real interesting finding was the fact that improvements in arterial distensibility, which is also a marker of endothelial wall damage, is more closely associated with the change in OSA severity rather than the changes in body weight and fitness. And uh, at Towson, we looked at vasodilatory capacity and people's self-reported sleep quality, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, and found that regional blood flow was actually less in those people who reported low vasodilatory capacity, independent of their physical activity status and their body weight and their age, implying that the sleep is what is potentially influencing this relationship. And so right now we're uh, engaged in an exercise study at Towson looking at this very concept whether those people with sleep apnea, is their endothelium impaired? And is it enough to override what we do with exercise? So in other words, which one of these, the negative or the positive, wins out with regard to leading to cardio protection? Does the exercise win out or is exercise too much, or uh, sleep ap or exercise, can we overcome the negative consequences of, of sleep apnea? And this is called the SAVE study, the Sleep Apnea Cardiovascular and Exercise Study, which is sponsored by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, where both individuals with OSA and without OSA are exercise trained for six weeks, and we are following them and measuring vascular outcomes before and after exercise training to see whether the potential improvements in vascular health with exercise are attenuated in those with sleep apnea. And so the significance of this work is that if we confirm this hypothesis, and this is attenuate, so sleep apnea attenuates the impact of exercise and vascular health, we have, will have reinforced the need to move sleep to the forefront of exercise medicine. And this may lead us to change our exercise, exercise prescriptions and modify the dosage, change the intensity, time, duration, at least these for these uh, patients, and certainly treat their apnea if we want to gain the, the best benefits that we can possibly imagine getting with exercise training. If we reject the hypothesis, then we'll demonstrate that the vascular function is amenable to modification using currently practice guidelines. Either way, we will be able to continue to refine our behavioral therapies to reduce cardiovascular disease risk in patients with and without OSA in the long term. So with that, I thank you all for sticking around. I appreciate it, and I'll take any, any questions you may have. Not offhand, I do not. Now that's a and that's an interesting question and something that we would ultimately want to move toward because with CPAP, you're treating the disorder. So presumably, the individuals on CPAP would have that added advantage, and hopefully we'd see that positive change to a degree that's similar to people who have not had sleep disorders at all. Okay, thank you.